Hey everybody, John Abdo here, author of Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo. I know repeatedly in previous presentations, I've talked about the fact that a lot of people really did not like Milo. They weren't impressed with Milo. They didn't like the big muscles. They didn't like the fact that he can carry a bull. All brawn, no brains persona. Since all brawn and no brains, this particular presentation is dedicated to the brains that Milo was introduced to Pythagoras. He was born in the Isle of Samos. It's a Greek island surrounded by the Aegean Sea. Pythagoras was a very interesting figure in world history, but he made a huge influence on Milo. Pythagoras is known as the master seer, dedicated his whole entire life to wisdom. Pythagoras was described as taller than average. He was athletically muscular, and they say he was strikingly handsome. That's what the writers say. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just repeating what the writers have said, strikingly handsome. But Pythagoras was such an honest man. He didn't use his good looks to manipulate or gain favors from other people because he believed in honesty and that wisdom was the greatest gift in the universe. Pythagoras was a believer in metempsychosis. And metempsychosis is literally, today we would call it reincarnation, but metempsychosis is literally the soul transmigrating into other bodies because he was also a holocaust. And a holocaust is a way of thinking that all matter contains its own gods. He could see the flexing energy inside rocks and leaves and planets and everything. So Pythagoras seen everything from a universal standpoint. He seen everything with vibrational, fractal, numerical configurations. He believed that the universe was governed by music or sound or vibration and mathematical chords, mathematical symbols that he would observe the universe. Herodotus, Isocrates, Plutarch, Xenophon, Homer, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all made mention of Pythagoras in their historical writings. But Pythagoras wasn't satisfied with the knowledge that he was obtaining, talking with and collaborating with other philosophers of his time. He wanted to seek higher wisdom. So he set his sights on Memphis, Egypt, at the Egyptian Mystery School of Wisdom, where knowledge and the secrets of life were kept in great stock. He wanted to be an initiate. He wanted to learn their secrets replete with breathtaking architectural design the institution is surrounded by towering monolithic granite statues iconic rune stone monuments and emblematic stone reliefs the structure's walls and gaping arches rise over 65 feet high made from thousands of perfectly masoned limestone and sandstone blocks precisely arranged and held in place by their own weight and the magnetic forces of the earth pythagoras paces down the corridor entering a grand vestibule which is flanked by arcing stone pylons. Once inside the atrium, he approaches a commanding entryway that is secured by imperious double-sided bronze-plated doors. His time has come. The wisdom seeker exaltedly grabs hold of the large metallic ring clenched in the jaws of a bronze-headed lion. As he lifts the knocker, Pythagoras believes the forthcoming vibrations will forever change his life. After striking the door, knock, 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 Pythagoras straightens his posture, touts the wrinkles from his tunic, and awaits a greeter. Knock, 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 and he waited. He waited for someone to come and answer the door. Finally, who are you? Why do you come and disturb our peace? I am Pythagoras. And where are you from? I am from Samos. Go away, you fool. Samos is in rule of Polycrates. And Polycrates was a tyrannical ruler who killed his brother, and he used wisdom for obviously evil things. The Egyptians knew this, and they told Pythagoras, go off, you foolish man. But Pythagoras says, but I am a son of Apollo. And they all started laughing. I mean, who would have the gall? 
to say that they're a son of any type of god, let alone Apollo, who is one of the Greeks' top gods, second order to Zeus. The Egyptian explains, you must retreat to the desert. Forty days, forty nights. Surely the son of Apollo can endure that. So they told Pythagoras, and if you want to come into our school, we have an initiation process. 40 days and 40 nights out in the desert. They knew that that was going to kill the guy. There's no way you could survive 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, especially under the conditions. No one can make it. The Egyptians knew that he could not make it, that this guy was going to die from either dehydration, caloric deprivation, heat exhaustion, getting stung by some venomous creature or whatever. Pythagoras, they said, shave off all that ugly hair on your head and face. He had a beard. 40 days and 40 nights, deep breathing, respiration, discipline. And Pythagoras says, I don't need any sort of discipline. I come here to seek knowledge. And the Egyptians responded, discipline is knowledge your first passage to get into our institute. 40 days and 40 nights out in the desert. Reluctant and frustrated, Pythagoras went to the desert. 40 days and 40 nights, he survived. When the Egyptians picked him up on the 40th day, they were astounded. They go, maybe he is the son of a god. Maybe he is the son of this, what the Greeks call this Apollo god, because they didn't worship Apollo. They had their own gods, obviously. The first thing when he became an initiate at the Egyptian Mystery School of Wisdom, the Egyptian says, you passed the first test. Now you will remain silent for 12 years listening to the ethers and collect all the knowledge from the vibrations of the universe. As requested Pythagoras stayed silent for 12 years. He kept advancing in his order, in his ranking within the Egyptian Mystery School of Wisdom. He stayed there for 22 years total. After Pythagoras reached the highest level of order within the Egyptian Mystery School, all of a sudden the Institute and Egypt is going to be raided by the Persian ruler Cambyses II. And Cambyses was en route to take over Egypt and crown himself Egyptian pharaoh, which he ultimately did. Pythagoras sought refuge in Croton. Why did they go to Croton? I don't know. Maybe they heard about this guy. Actually, at the time, a teenager was carrying a bull and was also being called like a second coming of Hercules, which is a son of Zeus and Apollo is related to Zeus. Milo was still in his maturation. Maybe Pythagoras seen the future of Milo in his, in his meditations. The physicians of Croton were considered the foremost in all of the Greek world, Herodotus. And also Croton was known for a bunch of other great accomplishments, but one other one Croton had the greatest physicians in the world, Caliphon and Democrates, who were in favor with the Persians. They treated the Persians. They treated King Darius and Megabyses, a former Persian general, after hunting expeditions, chariot racing accidents, and battle, and things like that. So the Persians actually utilized Croton's medical institutions. So what better way for Pythagoras to protect himself by a self-protected city-state of Croton, which the Persians are in favor of. They'll utilize Pythagoras's assets in Croton, still gain access to Milo, still gain access to Caliphon and Democrates. So Pythagoras goes to Croton and they welcome Pythagoras. Can you imagine Pythagoras and his initiates getting off the boat, walking down the slipway, hooded tunics over their heads, and just walking real slow in spiritual order? The people of Croton must have said, we have another God coming to our city-state. 
We have Milo, who is regarded as the son of Zeus and the second coming of Hercules. Now we got a son of Apollo. And in the book, I talk about Diotimus, Milo's father, also being revered as the son of Apollo. When Pythagoras went to Croton, he established the Pythagorean School of Wisdom. And the Pythagorean School of Wisdom, in addition to Milo, in addition to the uh, hospital or the infirmary or the medical institution by Caliphon and Democrates, Croton is really flourishing now. People around the world is like, that city-state's got everything. So he developed the Pythagorean School of Wisdom, and as usual, like most great people or great things are criticized, and Pythagoras was criticized because he did not demand the prerequisites that were demanded by the Egyptians. He didn't send people to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. What he did is probably sit down with them, he vetted them, asked them some questions, looked into their eyes, maybe, you know, study their habits, maybe ask them some questions. What would you do if, what would you do if, you know, how they will respond. Within the Pythagorean School of Wisdom in Croton, there was three orders of initiation. The first one was called Akutisi. Akutisi are people who lived at home, but they were serious about learning, and they would go to the Pythagorean School of Wisdom on a daily basis, go to their classes, lectures, meditate, read the hieroglyphs, or whatever they had to do, and then they would go home at night. The second order was called Mathematikoi, and Mathematikoi relates to the mathematics that Pythagoras incorporated into his wisdom seeking and his wisdom thinking, about symbols in the universe, the stars, and everything had, had an order to it. Mathematicoi are people who learn the mathematical significance of the universe, but they give up all their possessions, they live in the Institute permanently, they own nothing but just their thought process, and they're probably walking around every day with their heads hung, the head, hoods of their tunics, pulled over their heads, and they're just meditating day and night constantly in deep contemplation, just dwelled on the wisdom that was being taught within the walls of that fantastic edifice. And the last and highest order within the Pythagorean school of wisdom was called Electi, where the people who lived permanently in the institution, they gave up all their personal possessions, like the Mathematicoi, they gave up all their personal possessions. The Electi are people who've developed some really miraculous powers and abilities. They could heal with music, they could heal with sound. They are taught in psychic transmutation, which is delivering thought processes to people either across the room or across the world. And they just developed a level of psychic phenomenons that were above what other people were gaining at that time as far as those who were initiates within a ideological institution. While Pythagoras was in Croton, he had some remarkable achievements. With the occasional use of an astrolabe, Pythagoras's cosmological observation taught that the five orbiting planets that we knew of at the time, human beings knew of, which is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Earth, obviously, is number six, but the five known planets at the time of antiquity, 2,500 years ago, that they were spherical and they orbited around the sun. And unarguably, at the time, the philosophers and cosmologists back then says the sun orbits the earth. But Pythagoras boldly said that the earth orbits the sun, and he was criticized for that. He was definitely criticized for that. So he came up with that. He's seen and heard vibrations in the universe. He's seen mathematical symbols in the universe. Everything was mathematical to him. He's seen numbers and symbols, and that's how he was able to calculate the position of the stars and the and the planets with the, uh, with the sun. It was really a remarkable discovery that has carried on literally for thousands of years. He wasn't wrong about that. And he also said that the earth was round. People didn't think the earth was round back then, in spite of, which I can't understand myself, in spite of everything else being round up there.
And when it comes to music discoveries, which are still active today, Pythagoras discovered octaves. He discovered octaves by passing a blacksmith's shop and seeing blacksmiths with their hammers hitting anvils and hearing the chords or the tunes, the different weight of the hammer, the size of the hammer, the different weight of the anvil. Other writers say that Pythagoras developed the octaves by taking two ends of a string, plucking it, and it was one melody, and then dividing it exactly in one half, and it was exactly one octave higher, just because of the length of the vibrational distance between the two points of that chord. He brings those sounds up into the universe because Pythagoras, again, knowing that there was five orbiting planets, he was able to not just see, but he could hear the vibrations of the universe when he meditated and just contemplated the heavens and was able to see all that. Pythagoras' theorem is probably the most important theorem in mathematics. Norman Wildberger, Professor of Mathematics, University of South Wales. In mathematics, Pythagoras had an outstanding discovery, which is known as the Pythagorean theorem. The sum of the square of the hypotenuse on a right-sided triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. But it was a remarkable discovery in mathematics which led to the building of structures much easier and safer and stronger. Also, when he was in Croton, he met a woman named Theano. He married Theano, and they had three daughters, all girls, obviously, the strikingly good-looking guy. One of his daughters, Maia, married Milo. So Milo's wife was the daughter of Pythagoras. How convenient was that? And all that, again, it's in the book. I write it all in the book. There's a lot of things that I didn't know about Milo before researching and writing about Milo, especially this whole relationship with Pythagoras. Milo of Croton, a famous 6th century BC athlete, is undoubtedly the most celebrated sportsman of the ancient world. Milo of Croton is winning Olympiad after Olympiad after Olympiad. Obviously now he's a mature man in his 20s and 30s and 40s, and he's carrying the full-grown bull and as Croton continues to flourish, as Croton becomes more and more popular, if they weren't popular enough, it's like Milo won another Olympiad Games, the strongest man in the world, Milo of Croton, the greatest wrestler in the world, Milo of Croton, who's the second coming of Hercules, son of Zeus. You have the greatest physicians in the world, and now you have the son of Apollo and Pythagoras living there, and so many other accomplishments and great people. On account of its antiquity, Sybaris naturally held a preeminent place in the communities of the region, but its immediate southerly neighbor, Croton, a mere 200 stadia separates them, was founded only a very short time afterwards. Although both city-states were founded by Peloponnesians and positioned less than 25 miles apart, the close proximity of Croton to Sybaris prevented the latter from expanding their borders, creating interminable animosity and conflict. The Sybaris just kept getting more and more animus. They kept getting more jealous. They kept slinging more propaganda and smear campaigns, which back in 710 B.C., when Croton was founded, after Sybaris was founded in 720 BC, Sybaris had 10-year head start. And what the Sybarites did, which I explained in a previous video, they just made themselves super wealthy and super lazy. They became complacent and lazy, drunk, and constantly in that state of delusion. And they hated Milo. They hated Croton. And they kept throwing propaganda, smear campaigns. They tried to rig sporting competitions. And just literally, they did whatever they can to demean Croton and Milo and Pythagoras. Probably their 
vineyards, which Croton made their own wine, so does Sybaris, but I'm sure people are buying Milo's wine. Why would you buy wine from Telly's, the tyrant of Sybaris? Telly's was so set on starting his own games. He's saying, no one can beat Milo. Our athletes are getting crushed in the competitions at the Olympiad Games. Let's have the Sybarite Games. And Telly's wanted to have his own games. He was trying to recruit people, athletes and officials and handlers and things like that. And what he was going to do, which I believe he was going to have the throwing events, javelin and discus throwing. And of course, since he controls everything, he's going to have his athletes lighter javelin, lighter discus, and they throw it further in the competition. Go, man, this, this discus is kind of heavy. It's like a 25-pound weighted plate. And the javelin is like, oh, man, this thing is heavy. So he was definitely going to cheat. He probably didn't want to have wrestling because he says wrestling was a brainless sport. He says Milo was a brainless athlete, a brainless person. So he tried to convince everybody to do that. Now there arose among the Sybarites a leader of the people named Telles, who brought charges against the most influential men and persuaded the Sybarites to exile the 500 wealthiest citizens and confiscate their estates. And when these exiles went to Croton and took refuge at the altars in the marketplace, Telles dispatched ambassadors to the Crotonites, commanding they either deliver up the exiles or to expect war. An assembly of the people was convened, and deliberation proposed on the question whether they should surrender the suppliants to the Sybarites or face war with a superior foe, and the consul and people were at a loss. From fear of the war, the Crotonites leaned towards handing over the suppliants, but when Pythagoras the philosopher advised they grant safety to the suppliants, they changed their opinions and accepted the war on behalf of the safety of the suppliants. Theodorus Siculus. In the process of doing that, Telles, the tyrant of Sybaris, the ruler of Sybaris, confiscated 500 of the top or wealthiest Sybarites. He confiscated all their wealth. He just locked down the treasuries and froze all their bonds and seized all their assets. And he says, either you listen to me, because by that time, the Sybarites were saying, hey, this guy, Telly, he's, he's a madman, and just exiled them from the city-state. But get out of here. If you're not going to support me, get out of here. And he feared a coup d'etat, so he got rid of them, threatening to kill them. Hey, you go, you go get rich somewhere else. I'm keeping your money. I made you rich. And he kicked them out of Sybaris, and they sought refuge in Croton. Tellies couldn't believe that the Sybarites would even think of going to Croton, even if they lost all their assets or whatever. All Sybarites hate Croton, even the ones that supposedly get kicked out. But nonetheless, Croton accepted the 500 Sybarite refugees by way of persuasion by Pythagoras, who met with the Cretonian Senate and Council. He says, we have to accept these people. Otherwise, Tully's, if they go back, we send them back. He's going to murder. He's going to slaughter all these people. So Croton, probably many in the hierarchy, reluctantly took the 500 Sybarites. And that's another story for another day. But he took, they took the 500 Sybarites. And Tully says, return those people or it's war. Pythagoras told the Cretonian consul, if we return these people or tell them to go back to Sybarites, Tullius is going to execute every single one of them. The Sybarites went to war with 300,000 men against the Crotonites. And starting an unjust war, they stumbled into destruction. And being skillful enough to bear their prosperity, they left their own destruction as a particular stark example for all men to fear almost as much in times of good fortune as in times of adversity. So the Sybarites that were exiled from Telles' uh, city-state of Sybaris were allowed to stay in Croton. Telles declared war, and the great battle of Sybaris, which I've written about, obviously, in detail in the book, and done several videos here on the battle of Sybaris, really interesting battle. Milo went to the battle wearing his Olympiad crowns, 
and a lion's pelt that he killed with his bare hands. They put his effigies of all of his Olympiad, seven Olympiad bronze statues, replicas, you can imagine, around the battlefield with the, uh, with the cornices blowing into the horns and the harpists strumming the strings. When the Sybarites advanced against them with 300,000 men, the Crotonites opposed them with 100,000 under the command of Milo, the wrestler. Milo had an inferior army. 100,000 seems like a lot. The Sybarites had 300,000. But anyway, I won't get into more detail on the Battle of Sybaris. I just, I just thought it was really interesting for me that when I was writing about this guy who carries a bull and he's the greatest wrestler in the world, I thought that's what I was going to be writing about. But I wrote two battle scenes, one of them being the Battle of Sybaris. I take a lot of pride in that because I did a lot of studying on the Battle of Sybaris. Obviously, I'm telling the story about how and why Sybaris developed so much animosity. 720 B.C., Sybaris is founded. 710 B.C., 10 years later, Croton is founded. And for the ensuing 200 years until 510 B.C., the Battle of Sybaris takes place and Milo just literally decimates the Sybarites. But anyway, Pythagoras, the master seer, the guy who is known to create miracles and transmutate the soul is just one of those figures that his discoveries are still relevant today. I took a fond interest in Pythagoras, obviously, because he's teaching Milo wisdom. But Pythagoras was a very influential figure in world history, particularly for the city-state of Croton to make Croton very popular. If it wasn't already popular enough with the greatest wrestler in antiquity, seven-time Olympiad wrestling champion, and the strongest man to have ever lived. Again, not everybody was in favor of this guy. They said, all bronze, no brains. But when Pythagoras came to town, let the brains begin. Hope you liked this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, please place them below. I didn't say everything about Pythagoras, so if you said you forgot about this, say, no, I really didn't. I just didn't have time for it. But anyway, I enjoy sharing this with you, and I enjoy you sharing your comments and feedbacks with me. Have yourself a great day. Talk to you soon. If you are enjoying this content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe. And I'll continue to bring you more fascinating information on Milo of Croton and other great mythological and mortal figures from antiquity. I'm John Abdo, thanking you for watching. Stay strong and healthy, and perhaps one day, thousands of years from now, people then will be remembering your name as well.